Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillah. Ve salatu ve selamu ala Resulillah. Ve alihi ve sahbihi ve man wala. Welcome to the last of our series of four lectures uh, in which we seek blessings from the recollection of uh, some of the truly great mujtahid imams of this community. Imam Malik, Shafi'i, Abu Hanifa, and now it's the turn of Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal al-Shaybani, radiyallahu an wa arda. We've uh, begun these lectures by recalling something that is important in Islam, which is the principle of family, the principle of genealogy. Uh, and we've seen how uh, that has shaped the specific personality, which is so distinctive with such enormous repercussions of, of each of these figures. And in the case of Imam Ahmad, what we find is uh, that he is, uh, unlike Abu Hanifa, he's from an Arab tribe, from the tribe of Shaiban, Bani Shaiban, and they are one of the noble tribes of the Arabs, uh, and they are famous for uh, being great warriors. So Muthanna, who was uh, uh, Sayyidina Abu Bakr as a general in the conquest of Iraq was from the uh, Bani Shaiban. And Imam Ahmad's family were actually Shaibanis on both sides. Uh, and the territory of Shaiban is roughly more or less what is now uh, the country of Kuwait and the desert around Kuwait. But their great city became the city of Basra um, uh, following the foundation of the city uh, at the time of uh, Sayyidina Omar. So that was the, the great Shaibani city. Um, his grandfather, however, had moved to Khorasan in Central Asia, um, where he was, it seems, the governor for the Bani Umayyah of the city of Sarakh, uh, which is now quite close to the border b uh, between Iran, uh, Afghanistan, and the former Soviet Union, and seems to have supported the Abbasid Dawah. Uh, Imam Ahmad's father, Muhammad, was a soldier. Some say he was an officer, but we don't know too much about him, except that the young Ahmad remembered that... Uh, uh, as a boy, his father would sometimes appear in his armour, in his uh, military uniform. Um, but uh, this was hearsay, because uh, the young Imam Ahmad actually seems never to have seen his father. His father died very young, when he was 30 or so. So, like some of the other Imams, like Imam Shafi'i, uh, Imam Ahmad essentially begins in a rather unpromising way as, as an orphan. father has, however, left them with a small property in Baghdad, and as we'll see, the income from this uh, rather small, modest property goes on to support him in later years. Being an orphan seems to have given him uh, a certain spirit of self-reliance, uh, ra rather, again, like Imam al-Shafi'i. A combination of poverty and good lineage led to a kind of nobility. And his love for the poor and the fact that he himself chose to live amongst the poor does a lot to explain his later connection and his strong connection of his heart to the Zohad and to the, the Sufis of, of Baghdad. But although um, the family have come recently from Khorasan, it said that his mother was pregnant with him when they arrived in Baghdad. He's brought up in and spends most of his life in Baghdad, Dar es Salaam, then the great extraordinary palliating capital of the greatest uh, imperial civilization that the world has ever seen. And in this city, Every tendency is present and flourishing. His mother could have sent him to study anything. Uh, it was all there, but her preference was to direct him towards hifs and towards fiqh and hadith. Uh, it seems that in his early teenage years, he spends time in the royal scriptorium. The Abbasids have this truly gigantic city within a city palace. And at the entrance to the palace, there is uh, a place where the scribes would sit, um, a kind of diwan. And often one of his tasks, as he earned uh, a little money here, would be to uh, function as a public scribe. Uh, and one of the things he recalled doing was to read soldiers' letters to their wives. Uh, the wives often couldn't read, so they would take the letter to this place where people uh, would, would read them out to them. And this is said to be one of the, one of the ways in which Imam Ahmed learnt about his society, because he would discover all of these things that the, that the soldiers were confiding in their wives, and then he would write the wives' letters back to the soldiers, and from an early age got a, a, a good sense of the reality of his society. And like all the other great imams, we find that he had 
his ear close to the ground. He really understood his people, uh, like Imam Abu Hanifa, who had his shop, Imam Shafi'i, with his great travels and his concern with the poor, Imam Malik, living in the heart of the, the community of Medina. He was a man of the people who really understood the people. And that's one reason for the success of his fiqh. Subsequently, it was practical because it was rooted in the wisdom of somebody who really understood where people were. Um, it said that one of the other scribes, looking at this boy, who was perhaps 13 at the time, uh, made a prediction. And the prediction was, In If this young boy lives, he will be a proof against the people of his time. He was expecting that this uh, young man would have an extraordinary future. And indeed, this prediction turned out, of course, uh, to be true. There were various sciences available in, in Baghdad, everything from philosophy to, uh, to hadith to various sectarian possibilities, but his choice was always for religion. And basically religion at the time meant, for the majority of the scholars, the detailed study of fiqh or the detailed study of, uh, of hadith. Um, Iraq contained particularly the madhab of Abu Yusuf and uh, Shaybani, and it's said, in fact, that his first teacher was, was Abu Yusuf. But quite soon he moves away from the detailed study of fiqh and finds that his real love is something that he continues to cultivate and become a champion of for the rest of his life, which is the study of, of hadith. However, when people say that he just didn't know fiqh, he wasn't really a faqih, this is wrong. Uh, because his pupils, including one of his pupils, Al-Khalal, would say that he did study fiqh, it's just that his heart wasn't in it. Lam yaltafit ilayhi, as Al-Khalal says. Uh, and he continues uh, studying hadiths in the city of Baghdad uh, until the year 186, when he goes to Basra. And in the following year, he moves on to the Hijaz and later to Yemen. And one of the the heroic things about Imam Ahmad, we tend to think of his standing up against the Abbasid heresy as his great moment of heroism. But in a sense, the greatest sacrifices he made were not in the prisons of, 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 uh, of the Khalifa, but rather in the extraordinary uh, poverty which he chose and the extraordinary difficulty of the journeys which he made. Um, in Baghdad, he had already spent seven years studying hadith after he decided that that would be his knowledge. Basically, his teenage years were spent in the study of hadith. And he spends four years in particular with Hashim bin Bashir, who's one of the imams of the muhaddithin at the time. Hashim dies, and then he spends another three years in Baghdad with a, uh, a variety of, of other teachers. And then he goes to Basra. Of course, his tribe is originally from there. And he seems to have made about five trips altogether to uh, the city of, of Basra. Um, and in uh, Basra, he was famous for having a, an attachment to the mosque of the, the uh, Masjid Mazin. Uh, and he was asked why he always prayed there. And he said, In the whole Masjid Abai, it's the mosque of my forefathers. It's important to remember that uh, even a great, severe scholar such as Imam Ahmad had this. It's not really a sentimental dimension, but it's, it's to do with honouring the memory of one's forefathers that he would just choose to go to this particular mosque because it was a mosque that had a connection with his family. Um, sometimes we think that that's a kind of sentimentality or superstition, but in fact, honouring the places of worship that were places um, of the Tawbah and the Salat and the Tahajjud of one's forefathers is an important principle in Islam, and it's something that, uh, that we need to revive. Certainly it seems to have been important for Imam Ahmed. So he's in uh, uh, Basra and then he goes to the Hijaz and it's here that he has an important meeting with Imam al-Shafi'i who he meets later on um, as we saw in the previous lecture in, in Baghdad as well. And Shafi'i had uh, really limitless respect for his knowledge as a student of hadith. Uh, and he told Imam Ahmed once, إِذَا صَحَّ عِنْدَكُمُ الْحَدِيثِ فَأَعْلِمْنِي بِهِ If a hadith is sound in your view, then teach me that hadith. Uh, now he combined these trips to the Hijaz with uh, the Hajj. And the first Hajj he makes is in the year 187, when he was at the age of 23. Again, it seems that he made the Hajj five times altogether. And on three occasions, 
And uh, those of us who complain about airport lounges and Hajj terminals now need to, to bear this in mind. Three of those occasions, he actually made the Hajj from Baghdad on foot, walking. And there were occasions when he actually got lost and had to shout out in the desert, hoping that somebody would point him to the road. Uh, on one occasion, it said that he, he, he spent only 30 dirhams on an entire Hajj, which is really little more than pennies. Uh, but uh, this was what he did. Uh, it wasn't just ihtisab, the desire for reward from Allah, but he went on foot to the Hajj. But also, he was simply very, very poor. Uh, perhaps of all of the great Mujtahid Imams, he was the one who cultivated poverty uh, most assiduously. In fact, um, this even uh, got in the way of his studies in so on some occasions. It said that he wanted to go to the city of Rai, which is in Iran, quite close to present-day Tehran, uh, in order to seek hadith there, but he simply couldn't afford the journey, and he wouldn't accept donations or, or, or gifts from anybody. Uh, so, so great was his poverty that one of his pupils remarked that his pillow was usually just uh, a, a block of unbaked clay, like a brick. But it seems that he didn't mind. He found in this spiritual wayfaring a kind of ease, the length of time walking, often on his own, uh, on foot through the desert as a way of refreshing his memory, repeating, 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 as one has to do if one is hafiz of Qur'an, hafiz of hadith, uh, you have to constantly go over it in your mind and contemplating Allah's signs. Um, uh, and his, as it were, enjoyment of this is indicated in a number of accounts, a very famous incident where he's made his hajj, and they're doing uh, tawaf. He's with Yahya bin Ma'in, who's one of the great uh, great hadith scholars. And they're making the tawaf. And Yahya sees Abdul Razak al-San'ani. Now, Abdul Razak is the top hadith narrator of the Yemen of the day, the author of the great Musannaf, which is one of the great early works of, of hadith. And Imam Ahmad has made the intention to travel to San'a in the Yemen in order to study with Abdul Razak. So Yahya says... He, he greets um, Abdul Razak, who he knows, he recognizes him by sight, and he makes an appointment with him to hear these hadiths uh, in his uh, place in Mecca the next day. And Yahya tells uh, Ahmad, Qad Allahu shahr wa raju'a shahr. Allah has saved you a journey of a, a month and a journey back of a month, because it took a month to go from Mecca to Sana'a. But Ahmad was actually upset and said, you have destroyed my intention. I made the intention of that journey for the sake of hadith and now I won't receive the blessings and the reward because uh, Abdul Razak is here. But in fact he goes to Yemen anyway because he's made this intention in the sight of Allah to do this. So he goes to Yemen and spends some time there with Abdul Razak. But it was it seems another journey on foot, an extremely difficult journey. Um, he runs out of money on the way and works for some porters. Akra nafsahu min ba'dil hammalin ila an san'a so he offered his services to a group of porters, carriers of heavy loads in public places, until he was able to, to reach Sun'a. And even though there were others travelling with him who saw that he was a, a deserving scholar of knowledge and he was already well known, he refused to accept uh, any offer of financial help from them. When he reaches Abdul Razak's house in Sun'a, uh, Abdul Razak um, also sees his need and tries to help him with some money. And he says, Ya Abu Abdullah, khudh hadha shay'a fantafi'a bi. O Abu Abdullah, take this little thing and benefit from it. Fa inna ardana laysat bi ardi matjar wa la maksab. Because this land of ours is not a place of trading, nor is it a place where it's easy to earn a living. Wa madda ilayhi bi dananir. And he offered him some coins. Fa qala Ahmad, ana bi khayr. And Ahmad said, I'm fine. And he stays in extreme poverty in Sana'a, in the Yemen, for two years, hearing the hadiths of uh, Abdul Razak, which are great uh, isnads from Az-Zuhri and Ibn al-Musayyib, which are simply not available in Baghdad. He hears these isnads for the first time. And so we have this image of him as an earnest student, uh, usually hungry, sometimes barefoot, travelling, but travelling with his books, because one of the characteristic features of the scholarship, the Hadith scholarship of Imam Ahmad, is that he likes everything to be written. And when he teaches, he teaches from books. Um, 
he was once asked why he continued to write hadiths even once he'd become a, a great imam. He continued to write things down. And he said, Ma'al mahbara ila al-maqbara. I'm with my inkwell until I reach uh, my grave. And he was indeed, uh, because he comes fairly late in the sequence of the, the four imams, living in the Asr al-Tadween, the age in which hadiths are being written down. Although he had memorized his hadiths, he would only teach when he had a text in front of him. Even if he knew something and didn't have the book, he would not just tell that person the hadith, he would write it down and then read from that text. This was his way of making sure that, that his scholarship was rigorous and that he could check things later. Uh, he did have this focus on hadith, um, uh, but also a focus on fiqh and qiyas, and if he'd only been a muhaddith, of course, there wouldn't really have been a madhab that bears his name, because a madhab is about fiqh, it's about fatwa, it's about judgment, it's not um, just a, a, a collection of hadiths. Um, he knew the fiqh, and he knew Qiyas, and he knew the positions of different schools, and because of his travels, he met with a wide range of different people, and there's something about his madhab that has a flexibility based on his knowledge of ordinary people and their difference. He spoke Farsi, for instance, uh, when people from his family came from Marr in Khorasan, they would stay at his house and he would speak to them in, in, in Farsi. Um, but essentially what he's doing is learning these hadiths and he learns, it seems, hundreds of thousands of them with the matan, the text of the hadith, and the isnad as well. And he recognizes that he'd missed a few, but really only a few. He didn't quite um, uh, uh, make learning hadith from Malik because he died too soon. He wasn't able to study with Ibn al-Mubarak, but otherwise he's studying with the great oceans of hadith knowledge in his time. When he reaches the age of 40, then he allows himself to sit to teach. Jalasa li tahdith. Why so late? 40 is already uh, a fairly advanced age at that time, and he knew so many hadith before then. Um, it seems that he was, uh, because of his respect for the science of hadith and his fear of making his mistake, he was interpreting the Quranic ayah which says, um, When he reaches his prime and reaches 40 years, he interpreted that, some of the jurists do, as meaning that full maturity of the mind comes at the age of 40 and not before. However, uh, Shafi'i had taught at an earlier age, uh, Imam Malik had taught at an earlier age, um, it seems that the reason why he waited was partly out of respect for his teachers who are still alive. He was too modest or too shy to teach um, in their presence and in their city. It may also be, and some of the ulama have suggested this, that it has something to do with his uh, desire to follow the sunnah in all things. That the Holy Prophet وسلم, began his ministry, his preaching, his risala at the age of 40, and he thought that this was an appropriate age in which one should begin to pass on the prophetic uh, legacy. Um, certainly, by this age, at the age of 40, he was already really famous, and it said that the first time he sat in the mosque to give hadiths, which was a kind of historic moment, really, vast crowds came. We don't know how many attended the first lecture, but generally it's reported that around 5,000 people would come to hear him recite uh, hadiths in the great mosque of uh, Baghdad. He had a lot of pupils. Of them, about 500 were really serious hadith students taking notes, but that's still a very considerable number. There would have to be people in the crowd who would repeat what he would say. This is the age before uh, microphones and, and amplifiers. So there would be a mu'aid, somebody who hears what's being said and repeats it so that people further back in the crowd can hear. Uh, and because this large number, that helps his, uh, his fiqh and his hadith to spread rapidly. So uh, he's really a celebrity. Thousands are attending. It's really the biggest thing that's happening in Baghdad at the time. Some people have come, and this is uh, something that is not sufficiently associated with the, the blessed memory of Imam Ahmad, they would come not for hadith, even though that was what he was teaching, but they came for the spiritual atmosphere, for the ambience of his majlis. So uh, Ibn al-Jawzi, who's one of his biographers and a member of his madhab, 
um, reports that one of the people who came to his uh, his classes would say this ikhtalaftu ila abi abdullah ahmed bin hanbal i went to the classes of um, ahmed bin hanbal ithnatay ashrata sana for 12 years wa huwa yaqra al musnad ala awladi while he was reading his musnad to his children basically his his spiritual pupils his 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 um, disciples fama katabtu minhu hadithan wahidan but i didn't write down a single hadith وَإِنَّمَا كُنْتُ أَمِيلُ إِلَى هَدِهِ وَأَخْلَاقِهِ وَآدَابِهِ I went because of my inclination to the guidance he was giving and his akhlaq and his adab. So it was an academic session. The rating hadith is a rigorous scholarly pursuit. But people would go because of the adab of the session, because of the akhlaq that he showed with his students and the akhlaq that his better students would show with him. It was in itself a kind of majlis of spirituality and not just a majlis of knowledge. This was his public lecturing. Uh, we know that he would teach also his very best students in his house. Um, but generally his, his big public profile in Baghdad is these public lectures attended by thousands of people, which would happen every day after Asr prayers. And the sessions, his majalis, were famous for being very peaceful and very serious. He was a solemn person, absolutely earnest um, in his determination to dedicate his life to serving the prophetic legacy. So it said that never in any of his classes did he tell a joke or say anything humorous. This was because he considered his majlis, his class, to be a form of worship, and one should not be light-hearted during ibadah, during worship. One of his pupils recalled, "Lam ar al faqiru fi majlisin a'azzu minhu fi majlis Abi Abdullah." I've never seen a more precious or magnificent session or class than the majlis of Ahmad. "Kana fihi hilmun wa lam yakun bi ajul." It was, a time, it was a session of uh, dignity, of uh, gentleness. He was never hasty. He was immensely humble. The dominant mood was one of peacefulness and uh, seriousness and dignity. When he would sit in his session after the Asr, he wouldn't say anything until he was asked. He wouldn't just sit there and start booming, and people would listen, and then there'd be an opportunity for questions. Everything was an opportunity for questions. In other words, he would sit there, and people would ask him questions about hadith, and then he would narrate. Uh, the, it seems there were two things that he would do in these hugely important uh, academic sessions in, in the heart of Baghdad. He would dictate these hadiths, and secondly, he would offer fatwas and judgments. Now, whereas people were writing down hadiths, and as we've said, he emphasized the importance of writing hadiths, and he had the text in front of him, he would not uh, allow anybody to write down these fatwas and judgments. And actually, he didn't like to see any collection of his own fatwas that had ever been written down. Um, and we'll see the reason for this in due course. Now, his... Majlis is really the spiritual heart of Baghdad. It's the greatest thing that's going on in the world's greatest, biggest, most prosperous, powerful city. Uh, and uh, he's right at the heart of it. Uh, but the city is uh, in many ways religiously unstable and unhappy. There's uh, a growing polarization between people who just want to use reason, including the philosopher, um, the first stirrings of uh, the influence of Greek philosophy in the uh, Arabic-speaking world. There are also people who are absolute zealous literalists. Um, there are people who are mystics, both orthodox and unorthodox. There are many religious minorities. There are the Mu'tazilites um, becoming extremely powerful. And uh, it's inevitable, really, that this extraordinary phenomenon of his majlis, his Asra majlis in the great mosque of Baghdad, did not become the lightning rod for the, the, the inner instabilities of the Abbasid era of this age. <coughs> and hence the most famous episode in his life is to do with the famous Mihna. Mihna means trial, tribulation, <coughs> often translated as inquisition. 
And this episode begins with the Abbasid Caliph uh, al Ma'mun and continues with his successors, his brother al Mu'tasim and then al Wathiq. The key issue uh, was the increasing influence of the Mu'tazilite sect in uh, imperial circles. And the issue that the Khalifa al Ma'mun liked in particular and really made it towards the end of his life. Um, his mission to try and propagate in the Islamic world uh, was the idea that Allah's speech is something that originated in time, that it was created. This is an idea that had been floating around since the time of somebody called Ja'ad bin Dirham in the Umayyad period, uh, also somebody, a rather mysterious person called Jahan bin Safwan, seems to have proposed the same idea, that there was a time when Allah did not know what his book would be, and then he kind of brought his book into being, ihdath, he created or wrote the book, and before that it just didn't exist. It's, uh, to put it more technically, it's a denial of the divine attribute of speech. It was a time when Allah was not saying anything and had no knowledge of this communication that would take place. And the Mu'tazilites generally denied that speech is an attribute of the divine so when Allah says, Kalam Allahu Musa Teklima, Allah spoke to Moses, for the Mu'tazilites, for most of the Mu'tazilites, it's not really possible that a transcendent, impersonal deity could speak. That's a quality of human beings. So what it means is that God created in the burning bush, the Ulaiqa, uh, the capacity to speak. So they reinterpreted these Quranic verses in order to get out of the, the belief that they didn't like, which is that um, uh, Allah has a quality of speech. Now you might think that's an eccentric idea that's unlikely to have much traction. Obviously, revelation is God's speech and God has always had this, this quality. Uh, but the Mu'tazilites are gaining in strength and, and are infiltrating uh, the circles of power there in the caliphal entourage and uh, the caliph al Ma'mun seems to have been very attached to them um, one of the great Mu'tazilites Abu Hashim al Fulti, it said that the Khalifa would almost stand for him when he came in which is not what a Khalifa is supposed to be but he seems to have this thing in his soul that he really venerates the Mu'tazilites as these great rationalist scholars and he'd also been, earlier in his career, a student of somebody called Abu Hudayl al-Alaf, who was one of the major early Mu'tazilites, from whom he'd learnt information about the various sects that were appearing in his empire. <clears throat> in any case, in the year 212 of the Hijra, right at the end of al Ma'mun's life, he declares uh, that the Qur'an is created, makhluq, and that this is to be an official doctrine of the Khilafah. At that time, uh, he doesn't impose it, but later on, in the year 218, he imposes it by force. And he requires his staff and his army to uh, round up the fuqaha and the ulama uh, and to force them to subscribe to this new doctrine. That the Qur'an didn't exist, Allah had no idea of what it would be, and then brought it into being, just as we would write uh, a book having composed it. Any scholar who refused was told that his testimony would not be accepted in a court of law or in a contract and that they could not hope to hold judgeships or any other uh, public office. And a long list, a kind of inquisitorial register of everybody's views was sent to al Ma'mun, who then ordered that dissidents, people who wouldn't sign up to this, this new doctrine, would be uh, arrested and even threatened with execution. Now, most of the scholars threatened with execution and reprisal against their families, didn't want the entire uh, class of Sunni ulama to be wiped out, and publicly affirms uh, the new teaching, sometimes finding forms of words that would enable them to get around it. Most of them actually uh, uh, conformed to what was, after all, the order of the Amir al-Mu'mineen, the Khalifa. But some of them refused, and they were indeed arrested, and they were tied up and, and chained. One of them uh, was uh, Yusuf al-Buwaiti, one of uh, Imam Shafi's companions, who was hauled out of Egypt uh, and died in prison. Nu'aym bin Hamad was another great scholar who refused to subscribe to the new doctrine and who died in, in custody. Um, Ma'mun at this time, that this kind of revolutionary new law, there's never been any kind of official attempt to promote a doctrine 
in the Sunni world before. The Khalifa has adopted a hands-off approach. This is something new. Matmon is in the Syrian city of Tarsus, and the scholars, the major scholars, are ordered to go to him. Uh, free scholars, if they accept the new doctrine, or in chains, if they uh, don't. But uh, the angel of death gets to Al-Ma'mun first. And some of the scholars breathe a sigh of relief and think, this craziness is now over. We've never had this kind of official imposition of a theology before. Um, and this is the wrong theology. This is a kind of rich man's or a caliph's fantasy. It doesn't make sense. But before he dies, al Ma'mun uh, extracts a pledge from his brother, al Mu'tasim that when he becomes caliph, uh, he is going to maintain this policy. Khud bi sirati akhika fi khalq al-Qur'an. One of his last words to him are, follow your brother's policy in maintaining the idea that the Qur'an is created. Now, the as it were, evil genius, the kind of Rasputin behind all of this, is a Mu'tazili theologian called Ahmad ibn Abi Du'ad, who it seems has persuaded the Khalifa that not just should he send out letters saying this is the correct doctrine, but that he should actually punish and torture people who don't subscribe to it. He's a, a serious hardline Mu'tazili. Um, the worry that they have when you try to understand why anybody should think in these terms is uh, what is termed in our theology as ta'addud al-qudama. That is to say that uh, there cannot be a multiplicity of uncreated entities. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one, and there can't be a kind of cluster of entities existing beside him, including the Qur'an, from before the creation of the world. Everything is created other than Allah. For the Mu'tazilites, things are either khaliq or makhluq the creator, and that's only Allah, or makhluq, creatures. And since Allah is not the creator, it must be created. This is the way they are thinking. Of course, from the Sunni perspective, the idea that you can anthropomorphize Allah and say that he kind of composed the Qur'an, that there was a time when it just wasn't there, uh, is uh, an aberration. You can have a completely simple and indivisible unitary deity, Allahu Ahad, but still acknowledge that within the unity, the indivisibility of that data, you have of that deity, you have a knowledge of all of the different things that will exist in the future. Uh, this is not the god of Plato, who doesn't know anything really, but just em emanate into the world. This is the the god of the Quran, who is all knowing and all powerful, and for whom even time is not real. He is not subject to time. For him, the future, like the past, is an open book. So, uh, for the Sunni perspective, this idea that Allah didn't know what the Qur'an would be and he was completely simple and didn't have all of this foreknowledge of things like the Qur'an is just an absurdity. Uh, but in any case, Ibn Abi Du'ad, this evil genius in the palace, uh, has an, ex uh, an influence now over the new Khalifa, Al-Mu'tasim. Um, Mu'tasim is a kind of simple guy. He likes his pleasures, he's a soldier, and he just allows this religious policy to be in the hands of, of, of Ibn Abi Du'ad. Um, when Ma'mun dies, uh, Imam Ahmad, who's been taken off uh, to, uh, to Tarsus to explain himself to the Khalifa, sent back to Baghdad and thrown into prison until the new Khalifa takes a uh, decision. He's asked to repent again, and he refuses, and then he's flogged repeatedly. It said, daily whippings for 18 months of the imam in prison. This continues and continues and continues until it becomes clear that he's not going to change his mind and this is making the Khalifa pretty unpopular, so he's released and he goes back home. He's very sick, he's wounded, he's aged, uh, and all he can do is to go out to the mosque, but he doesn't uh, resume teaching until at least his, his, his wounds have healed. And then, scarred, finding it difficult to walk, he finally, another great moment, having kind of faced down the, the Khalifa himself, sits down in his masjid and resumes his teaching once again. Mu'tasim dies, uh, and the new Khalifa, Al-Wathiq, starts up the Inquisition again. But it's quite clear to these soldiers who are in power that this has not been a great success, this policy. Uh, Imam Ahmad and those who have stood with him against the Mehna, against the Inquisition, are really popular. Um, so 
uh, Wathak's new policy is not to put uh, Imam Ahmad back in prison, but to uh, prevent him from speaking to anybody or meeting anyone. So he's kind of under, half, under house arrest until al Wathak in his turn dies. So he gives no lectures now for five years until the year 232. But when the Khalifa dies and he goes back to his masjid, it's kind of returning in triumph. The people of Baghdad turn out, they cheer as he walks through the streets and he sits down. And the, the ulama, in their uh, persistent upholding of, of the true doctrine of the divine attributes, have uh, triumphed. The mehna is still in force, but it's unpopular and um, it, is, it doesn't really outlive uh, al wathaq uh, The caliph is imposing something that nobody really can figure out. Uh, and there's even stories about how it was kind of a joke. Uh, al wathaq had a well-known jester um, who was called Obada. He used to tell jokes about this. One day he was trying to amuse the Khalifa and said, one day the Qur'an will die. And the Khalifa says, that's outrageous, how can the Qur'an die? And he said, well, every living thing dies, everything that comes into being die, uh, must die. So since you say that the Qur'an came into being, you must say that one day the Qur'an will come to an end. فَضَحِكَ الْوَاثِقْ وَقَالْ قَاتَهْ لَكَ اللَّهِ أَمْسِكْ And uh, الْوَاثِقْ, the Khalifa, smiled and laughed and said, um, May Allah sort you out. Um, stop talking like this. Uh, and towards the end of his life, al wathiq does stop the, the, the punishments. And there's at least one well-known story about how he finally realizes that this is not going to work. And a story about how Ibn Abi Du'ad is being reproached in the, the palace by one of the famous uh, Sufis of, of Baghdad. Um, Yurwa, this is uh, narrated in uh, by Ad Damiri. An al Wathiq raja afi akhiri hayatihi an inzal al mehna. That al Wathiq, uh, towards the end of his life, stopped uh, the persecution. Biman la yara hadha al ra'i, persecuting those who didn't follow this opinion. إِذْ دَخَلَ عَلَيْهِ شَيْخٌ مِمَّنْ نَزَلَتْ بِهِ الْمِحْنَةِ And then one of the sheikhs on whom the mihna, the persecution, had descended, came into him. فَقَالَ فِي ضِمْنِ مُجَادَلَتِهِ مَعَ إِبْنِ أَبِي دُعَادِ And said in a dispute in the imperial presence with Ibn Abi Du'ad, شَيْءٌ لَمْ يَدْعُوا إِلَيْهِ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ وَلَا أَبُو بَكْرِ وَلَا عُمَرِ وَلَا عُثْمَانِ وَلَا عَلِي تَدْعُوا أَنْتَ النَّاسَ إِلَيْهِ Something that the Holy Prophet ﷺ never called people to, or Abu Bakr, or Omar, or Uthman, or Ali. You, however, are calling people to it. لَيْسَ يَخْلُوا أَنْ تَقُولْ عَلِيمُهُ أَوْ جَهِلُهُ You have to say either those people, the Holy Prophet and the four Khalifas, knew this, in other words, the Qur'an is created, or they were ignorant of it. فَإِنْ قُلْتَ عَلِيمُهُ and if you say that they knew it, وَسَكَتُوا an, but they didn't say anything about it, وَسِعَنِي وَإِيَّاكَ مِنَ السُّكُوتِ مَا وَسِعَ الْقَوْمِ Then it is, should be sufficient for me and you to fall silent as well. If the Holy Prophet didn't mention this doctrine, then it's fine for us uh, not to mention the doctrine. وَإِنْ قُلْتَ جَهِلُوا And if you say they were ignorant of it, وَعَلِمْتَهُ أَنْتَ And you, commander of the faithful, you do know this doctrine, but the Prophet and his companions didn't. فَيَا لَكَعْ إِبْنْ لَكَعْ Then you're a scoundrel, the son of a scoundrel. يَجْهَلُ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَالسَّلَمُ وَالْخُلَفَاءَ الرَّاشِدُونَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمْ شَيْئًا وَتَعْلَمُهُ أَنْتَ Is it possible that the Holy Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم could uh, not know something and you did know it uh, yourself? So this is what the, the Sufi is saying to the Khalifa. فَلَمَّا سَمِعَ الْوَاثِقُ ذَلِكَ وَثَبَ مِنْ مَجْلِسِهِ And when al-wathiq, the Khalifa, heard this, he jumped up from the place where he was sitting. وَأَخَذَ يُرَدِّدُ تِلْكَ الْكَلِمَاتِ And started repeating these words. وَعَفَى عَنِ الشَّيْخِ And he forgave the Shaykh. وَرَجَعَ عَمَّا كَانَ يَفْعَلْ And he uh, repudiated, uh, renounced, recanted what he used to do. This is one traditional account of how it is that the Abbasid Khilafah finally um, fell out of love with the doctrine of the createdness of the Qur'an. 
So Imam Ahmad uh, and the, the people of Taqwa in Baghdad who prevailed against the most powerful man in the world and his Mu'tazilite intellectualizing wazir. Um, let's look now a little bit more at uh, Imam Ahmad's lifestyle and his personal charisma because uh, this helps in understanding his fiqh and it's also something very beautiful and moving in its own right. We've seen how he used to travel on foot, sometimes getting lost in the desert, sometimes having to work his way um, because he refused to accept uh, a subsidy from anyone. We've seen that he has a very small income, really a few pennies from his father's legacy which continues. But he has a family and in order to support them uh, the historians narrate that he followed three methods. Firstly, one of the things he was famous for in Baghdad is that he would go to the Sawad, which is the countryside, the black earth, very fertile around Baghdad, and he would ask the permission of farmers, after the harvest was completed, if he could walk through the fields to see if he could find some grains that had been missed. Um, it's also narrated that sometimes he would work as a copyist, just writing things out for people. Um, and again, there's some interesting accounts of this. Uh, this one is from Tariq uh, al-Dhahabi, history of al-Dhahabi. Just to give you an example of uh, what his reputation was in these things. Kana uh, najar we used to have a neighbor, فَأَخْرَجَ إِلَيْنَا كِتَابًا And one day he showed us uh, a piece of paper which was uh, something something was written. فَقَالْ أَتَعْرِفُونَ هَذَا الْخَطُ And said, do you know this handwriting? قُلْنَا هَذَا خَطُ أَحْمَدْ بِنْ حَنْبَلْ And we said, that's the handwriting of Ahmed bin Hanbal. فَكَيْفَ كَتَبَ لَكَ So how did he write this for you? قَالْ كُنَّا بِمَكَّةَ مُقِيمِينَ عِنْدَ سُفْيَانِ بِنْ عَيَيْنَا Once we were staying in Mecca with Sufyan bin Uyayna, one of the great um, hadith scholars. فَفَقَدْنَا أَحْمَدَ أَيَّامًا And we didn't see Ahmad bin Hanbal for several days. ثُمَّ جِئْنَا لِنَسْأَلَ عَنْ And then we went to the place where he was staying, to his room, to ask about him. فَإِذَا الْبَابُ مَرْدُودٌ عَلَيْهِ uh, But he wouldn't open the door. فقلت, فَقُلْتُ مَا خَبَرُكَ And I said, what's going on? قَالْ سُرِقَ الثِّيَابِ And he said, somebody broke into my house and stole my clothes. فَقُلْتْ مَعْيَ دَنَانِيرُ And I said, I've got some money. فَإِنْ شِئْتَ صِلَةً وَإِنْ شِئْتَ فَقَرَضًا If you want, you can take it. If you want, I can lend it to you. فَأَبَى And Ahmad refused. فَقُلْتُ And he was obviously thinking about how he can get Imam Ahmad out of this fix. He can't leave because his clothes have been stolen, but he won't accept anybody's charity or even a loan. فَقُلْتُ تَكْتُبْ لِي بِأُجْرَ And I said, will you write something for me for a, uh, for a recompense? And he said, yes. فَأَخْرَجْتُ دِنَارًا So I got out a coin. فَقَالَ لِي إِشْتَرِي لِي ثَوْبًا وَقْتَعُوا نِصْفَيْنِ يَعْنِي إِزَارًا وَرِدَاءً And he said, buy me a simple tunic and cut it into two so I can have a, a rida and an izar, an upper and a lower garment. garment. Uh, وَجِئْنِي بِوَرَقْ And bring me some paper. فَفَعَلْتْ وَجِئْتُ بِوَرَقٍ فَكَتَبَ لِي هَذَا and I brought him some paper and he wrote this thing out for me. وَكَانَ يَنْسُجُ أَحْيَانًا And this is another thing that uh, Imam Ahmad used to do. There these three things. Firstly, he would glean in the fields. Secondly, he worked as a copyist. Uh, sometimes he worked as a weaver. كَانَ يَنْسُجُ أَحْيَانًا وَيَبِيعُ مَا يَنْسَجُ He used to weave and he would sell the things that he wove. Um, whether it was weaving as such or some kind of basic embroidery or um, just sewing things for people is not quite clear but there's a story of Ishaq bin Rahaway who also has a great Musnad another great Hadith scholar um, who was quite close to him who'd gone to Sana'a also to study with uh, Abdul Razak al-Sana'ani and stayed in the room above uh, Imam Ahmad and he used to report that uh, Imam Ahmad used to earn a living by uh, embroidering caps people would bring their caps to him and he would embroider nice patterns in them and earn a few pennies he did this because, unlike some of the other scholars, he refused ever to accept a gift, and particularly a gift from the, from the caliphs or the governors. Even though this was zakat, and in principle it was fine for the scholars um, in order to support sacred knowledge to take uh, the money of the Muslims in this way. And he would also quite strongly disapprove 
of his students uh, or colleagues doing so. Um, Imam al-Shafi'i knows about Imam Ahmad's refusal to take any official salary. Imam al-Shafi'i has come to Baghdad uh, and he's in Ahmad's circle. Um, he's teaching Imam Ahmad and he learns that the Imam wants to travel to Yemen uh, in order to learn some more hadiths despite his poverty. And Shafi'i had been asked by the Khalifa al-Amin to choose a judge for Yemen, so he proposes Imam Ahmad. Um, but Imam Ahmad says to his teacher, Ya Aba Abdullah, in sami'atu minka hadha thaniyatan lam tarani andak. He's speaking to Shafi'i, he's speaking to his teacher. Uh, if you ever suggest this to me a second time, you'll never see me again. This is his principle, his tawarra, is that he will not accept money from the state. Um, it seems that his reason for this was that the money might contain a shubha. That is to say, it might have been acquired in part by illegal, morally questionable means. Governments sometimes were quite arbitrary in the way in which they levied taxes, and he didn't want to be supporting himself in this very blessed task of acquiring and promoting sacred knowledge from any money that might have been appropriated from the Muslims in an unlawful fashion. So he, he had this, this wara. But certainly not all of the scholars took the same view. Abu Hanifa, Sufyan al-Thawri took his view. They, they themselves never accepted um, official sponsorship. Others did. Uh, Al-Hassan al-Basri, for instance, or uh, Imam Malik. Um, their view was that the scholars of the Ummah really like the army, and taxes exist in order to uh, support them, perfectly legitimate use of the, 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 the treasury. Uh, others tended to take what you might describe as a middle way, uh, working for the caliphs and taking their money, but giving the money in sadaqah. Uh, so this was uh, the policy of Imam al-Shafi'i, who used to work for uh, the Khalifa Harun al-Rashid, uh, but gave his salary away regularly to the poor or to his students. <coughs> uh, quite often this is the policy of the ulama, that they will accept an official post in order to help people in that post, and they will take the money, but they will not take it for themselves, but will give it to um, uh, the needy. But Imam Ahmad takes this more severe, uh, restrictive view, uh, but it also seems that he doesn't regard it as haram to take money from the state. It's his own personal scrupulousness that he doesn't want to support himself on money that might have been uh, unethically acquired. But he doesn't consider this to be a fiqh position. <coughs> so we find this great imam with his extraordinary triumph, the most popular man in Baghdad, uh, having been tortured for more than a year and then silenced for much longer and disgraced by the Khalifa, really carried in triumph to the mosque, having prevail, but always living this extremely austere um, uh, life of, of zuhud, of renunciation. Uh, and as we've seen, well, that's how he was brought up anyway. Uh, his mother was poor. Uh, but he also had a great love of the Sufis, and Baghdad is a great center for tasawwuf in his time. And even more, I think, than the other four imams, Imam Ahmad is keen to associate with the great Sufis of his time. He had a particular love for somebody who was perhaps the most most famous Sufi of Baghdad um, of the time, uh, Ma'ruf al-Karhi, who he called one of the Abdel, one of the uh, the great saints uh, named in the, in, in the Hadith, whose prayers are answered. He said uh, his, the prayers of this Sufi are always answered. Somebody complained once, said, you're spending a lot of time with Ma'ruf and you're venerating him and his memory, but he's not a scholar. And Ahmad said, nonsense. Is true knowledge anything other than what Ma'ruf has achieved? It's important to remember this. Sometimes we think of Ahmad and the Hanbalis as being kind of like the Zahiris. They're just interested in external things and there's no Batin, there's no inward wisdom. But look at how he says that this man, Ma'ruf al-Karhi, a simple Sufi who is busy converting Zoroastrians, and he's, but he's basically a man of Wa'az and Irshad and Hedi and, and Zuhd and Taqashuf, that he said, that is real knowledge. That is Islam in action. That is not just some kind of academic transmission. That is the reality of Islam. Uh, very interesting response. Um, he also respected the Sufis because of the virtue of murabata. Uh, some of the scholars in Baghdad 
just lived in sometimes considerable comfort, accepting judgeships, um, having quite substantial retinues, and never getting involved in the difficult stuff, such as um, fighting the jihad on the frontiers against the Byzantines, who are not so far away. Uh, but there was something called the virtue of murabata in that time, which meant that you took time off and you went to one of the frontier fortresses, which are often kind of in hilltop locations, very cold in winter in the Anatolian plateau, southern part of what's now Turkey, very difficult thing to do. And in those ribat castles, there would be obviously military training, but there would be a lot of dhikr and a lot of scholarship, a lot of transmission of hadith, a lot of memorization. But it was a difficult thing. But Imam Ahmad respected the Sufis because of their particular connection to this. And somebody who perhaps he loved more than anybody else who was alive in his day was uh, Bishr al-Hafi, known as Bishr uh, the Barefoot, who was in turn the teacher of Sariya Sakati and was well known as an exoteric scholar. He was a Hanafi. Um, some say that he followed um, the school of uh, uh, a Thawri, but probably he was a, a Hanafi in his fiqh, but a great Hadith scholar because of the close connection that existed in, in this period, both in Baghdad and Central Asia between the Sufis and the Ahl al-Hadith. So they're almost the same category of people. Bishr al-Hafi is a good example of this. Um, uh, Dara Qutni uh, says of Bishr al-Hafi, Zahid Jabal Thiqa. He's a Zahid, He's not interested in things of this dunya, but he's a mountain of scholarship and his thiqa is an absolutely reliable hadith narrator. And Imam Ahmad loved him as a hadith narrator. But uh, Bishr al-Hafi was also famous for murabata. He would spend time on the frontiers uh, as, a, as a soldier, or as a cavalryman, uh, in order to defend the world of Islam from the, the Byzantine threat. And this connection between the military uh, dimension of the religion with tasawwuf in this period is, is particularly well known. Uh, Bishr, uh, one could give lectures and lectures about Bishr, ibn Hafi, uh, Bishr al-Hafi. You can see why Imam Ahmad loved him and loved his company and regarded him as really as Islam in action. One famous story about uh, how once Bishr was walking from his majlis through the streets in Baghdad and the man who is completely drunk comes up to him and embraces him, say, yes, Sayyidi, yes, Sayyidi. He's drunk out of his mind, doesn't know what he's saying. He reeks of, of wine and he grabs him and kisses him on both cheeks and won't let go. Of course, the other disciples are shocked by this kind of uh, impure, disgraceful person. But Bishr doesn't push him away. He allows him to finish and go on his own way. And then Bishr and his murids are looking at him, his eyes fill with tears, and he says, there is a man who loves another man because he is imagining that there is some good in him. But perhaps the lover is saved, but the one who is loved is unsure about his final destination. Right. That's exactly the kind of, of Muslim that Imam Ahmad loved. Complete humility, lack of interest in dunya, lack of confidence about his own salvation and uh, thinking that this man who greeted him because of his love was inshallah a man who uh, Allah would save whereas he himself was unsure about his final destination. So many other beautiful stories about uh, Bishr al-Hafi, the great Sufi of Baghdad um, and he had a number of Sufis in his inner circle including one of the greatest of them all at the time, uh, Ahmad bin Abil Hawari and many of others who were narrating hadith directly from Imam Ahmad. So he's with the Sufis, he's really Zahid, he's living about as you know, simple a life as one can without dying of starvation. It's really austere. But he's a man of the Sunnah and does not neglect the Sunnah of marriage. And it seems he had a very lively, um, active, happy family life despite the very considerable poverty that, that he lived in. Uh, his first wife was called uh, Umm Abi Abbasa. She bore him uh, his son Saleh. Uh, when she dies, he marries uh, an Arab woman called Rayhana, who bears him Abdullah, who is his famous son, who goes on to become a Qadi and a narrator. And when she too dies, he says, May Allah have mercy on her. We lived together for 20 years and we never quarreled once. And he never married again. And it, it seems, although obviously private about his private life, that he had uh, a very great, deep, uh, uh, good relationship, loving relationship with these 
to women. So that's characteristically Islamic, ultimately, of course, prophetic. The zuhud, lack of interest in dunya and comfort, but the sunnah of marriage is something that is, is important for him. Let's briefly look at uh, some of the doctrinal issues surrounding him. We've seen his triumph against the might of the Abbasids in the issue of, uh, of the Khalq al-Qur'an. Allah's speech has always been his speech. It's uncreated. And that prevails, and it continues to be the Sunni doctrine to this day. Um, generally, in his doctrine, he is, as one would expect, uh, following the middle path of the Sunnis in a time when the extremes were all over the place. On the question of Sahib al-Kabira, he took the Sunni view. Sahib al-Kabira, the person who commits a mortal sin. People had argued in early Islam as to whether such a person is a believer, or an unbeliever, or what. The Khawarij said, he's an unbeliever. Uh, Al-Hassan al-Basri and his school say he's a munafiq. The Mu'tazilites say he's in a position between two positions. not a believer, he's not an unbeliever. But you can call him a Muslim, but he's in hell forever. For the Mu'tazilites, it's characteristic of their severity. Somebody who commits a mortal sin is in hell forever. But Imam Ahmad and all of the other four Imams are clear that such a person is a believer. His destiny is to be left to Allah. And this is characteristic of the Sunni position. It's very much Ahmad's position. He was well known for this in his time. Important to remember, you think of him as this really severe man who's imposing this uh, fiqh and this uh, hadith scholarship on himself and who will go to the wall and risk death rather than change his, his doctrine. But in fact, in his, in his doctrine and his teaching, absolutely part of the inclusive, beautiful middle way of Islam and completely allergic to any kind of extreme. So when he's asked about somebody who commits a mortal sin, a certain type of radical fundamentalist Puritan will say he's not a Muslim. We make takfir of him. It's not the way of Imam Ahmad. He says, لا نشهد على أهل القبلة بعمل يعمله بجنة ولا بنار. We don't testify to anybody who is of the people of the Qibla uh, who is doing any particular action that he is going to heaven or going to hell. However virtuous your action, you can't be sure such a person is going to heaven. However evil and disgusting somebody's action, you cannot say that Allah will definitely um, send him to hell. نَرْجُ salih وَنَخَافُ عَلَى الْمُسِيءِ We have high hopes for the person who is pious, and we are very afraid in the case of the one who is committing sins. وَنَرْجُ لَهُ رَحْمَةَ اللَّهِ But we still hope for Allah's mercy for him. So actually this doctrine is, is a very gentle doctrine and inclined to forgiveness and to giving people the benefit of the doubt. Um, sometimes uh, some people attribute to Imam Ahmad uh, following some of the consequences of some of the later people who attributed to themselves in his school the idea that he's a kind of literalist and a, uh, a, a mujassim. That is to say he has anthropomorphic ideas about Allah a physical god, like the Mormon god who actually has a, a body and occupies space and moves around in space, a finite god. Absolutely not Imam Ahmed's position. He even has a book called uh, Kitab Nafi at tashbih uh, And he even would discourage the use of gestures to interpret some hadiths. So um, the hadith that says uh, that the heart of the slave of Allah is between two of Allah's fingers, he would dislike it very much if somebody lifted up his fingers and moved them around in order to il illustrate that hadith, because it suggests that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can be somehow physically likened to human beings, that he has a form. This was absolutely um, alien to his doctrine. Let's move now and survey his, his fiqh. Now, we've indicated that his great love was hadith and not fiqh, and that he seems to have turned away from the circles of the fuqaha in his teenage years towards the circles of the muhaddithin. But uh, he does, as we've indicated, in his majalis, give fatwas as well as hadiths. But sometimes you couldn't tell the difference. It's said that he almost always began his fatwas with the word haddathana. It is narrated to us. Because he would like to give a fatwa in the form of a hadith. That's very characteristic of him and of the Hanbali matab. Um, essentially the way in which his usul work uh, was quite simple <clears throat> if the dalil uh, which supports the fatwa is there in an unambiguous muhkam for, form in the Quran then that is the madhab nobody will disagree with that 
Uh, if there is a sound hadith, he will follow that. If there is no hadith, then he will follow the unanimous position of the Sahaba, if it can be identified. <coughs> if they differed in their opinion on a particular issue of law, then he would look for some guidance from the Tabi'in, or sometimes he would take the verdict of an early scholar such as Malik and al awzai uh, what's characteristic of his method, and the method of uh, most scholars in his madhab, is that <clears throat> if there's nothing to contradict it, he will accept a weak hadith or a morsal hadith. Um, uh, that is to say, one that is narrated with uh, uh, the, somebody from the level of the, the, the layer of the Sahaba omitted, uh, which the other jurists generally don't use, except in certain very limited circumstances. But for Imam Ahmad, if you've got a weak hadith that says a particular thing, not contradicted by what the Sahaba said, or by a sound hadith, uh, then you can actually incorporate that into your fiqh. And finally, after that, he would sometimes allow the use of analogy. Uh, it's sometimes wrongly said that analogy and qiyas has no place in the Hanbali fiqh, but that's not correct. If there's a tarura, a necessity, they will... They will make use of it. Uh, his fiqh was also known for being practical rather than theoretical. <clears throat> Some of the ulama, and notably Imam Abu Hanifa, would uh, talk about uh, things that were taqdiri, that is to say, what if such and such a thing arose? What if a particular kind of animal fell into a well? Is the water impure? Imam Ahmad would generally not like questions like that. He would only deal with fatwas that related to things that were practical or that had actually occurred. Um, in terms of the use of rationality, reason, qiyas, figuring things out, he would not allow it in anything to do with the ibadat, forms of worship. But in the mu'amalat, public transactions, contracts, uh, laws, uh, many things can be left open. Because for the hanbalis, in the issue of ibadat, Everything is considered to be forbidden except that which is specifically provided for in Revelation. But in transactions, everything is considered to be valid unless it has been specifically um, invalidated by something that is there in the fiqh, in one of these hadiths, the Qur'an, saying of the Sahaba, uh, and so forth. So if there's no dalil to forbid something, it is considered to be permissible. We need to remember this because often we have the idea that the Hanbal is really strict that it's just following the literal sense of the hadith. If you can't find a sound hadith, then you use a weak hadith, and it's very, very uh, constricted. It's actually not the case at all because of this idea that, that things such as contracts basically partake in the quality of sihha or validity, unless you have some solid dalil to indicate otherwise. Hanbali madhab is often extremely uh, flexible. So in the issue of uqud or contract law, Hanbali law is actually much more permissive of different types of sales and contracts than the other uh, three madhabs. And the conditions for uh, contracting parties are made uh, really very easy. Which is one reason, incidentally, why modern Islamic banks, who we sometimes think of as bending over backwards to find sort of strange, ultra-liberal fatwas, will often find that the Hanbali position is the one that enables them to do uh, what they want in terms of licensing new Islamic financial products that will help the, the Muslims. It might seem strange to us who have this sort of uh, sometimes rather severe image of Hanbalism, but very often Hanbali contract law is much more practical and, and open and flexible than in some of the, uh, some of the other madahib. Um, another thing to remember is that maslaha is uh, a principle that uh, Imam Ahmad, if there was no nas, no text of any kind, <coughs> he would look to see where the interests of the Muslims were. And this can be important, rather like Imam Malik, although Maslaha is less important a principle for the Hanbalis than it is for, the, for Imam Malik. The uh, Malikis would sometimes engage in taqsis uh, and nusus if uh, the literal application of a Quranic text or a hadith would lead to something that to the jurist seemed to go against the public interest. Uh, the Malikis would often uh, determine ways in which those dalils refer to situations other than the situation that the jurist was looking at. The, the uh, method of Ahmad is to be much more reluctant 
to do that. So maslaha, public interest, is an important source of sharia, but somewhat less so, I think, than in the case of the Malikis. But in some of the later uh, Hanbalis stress maslaha very much, and the notorious cases, some centuries later, uh, a famous uh, Hanbali scholar, uh, Najmadin Tawfi, <coughs> who has a book in which he seems to say that because Allah's legislation is there to serve the interests of the Muslims, everything that can be determined to be the interests of the Muslims represent what, represents what Allah wants, even if it seems to go against something that's clearly in the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Well, that's an aberrant view, that's shadh, uh, but it nonetheless comes out of, in a rather extreme way, the, the Hanbali emphasis on practicality. But the emphasis on hadith is evident. And the great sort of dynamo of that, and that which gives Imam Ahmad his extraordinary capacity to endure hardship, uh, and the amazing dynamism and his determination to memorize, to know so much, to teach so much, for no earthly reward, <coughs> is the principle of love. The principle of love for the Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was known to have an intense love for the Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, his way of getting close to him was through the hadith. Um, so he used to love the city of Medina, and would spend time there on his way from Baghdad. And his son Abdullah narrates that uh, Imam Ahmad used to keep a hair of, of the Holy Prophet, which he would sometimes put in water, and then he would drink the water. Uh, there was in Medina at the time uh, qasa, which is a bowl which had belonged to the Holy Prophet wasallam. When he was in Medina, Imam Ahmad would make sure that uh, he would drink from this bowl. So there's a tremendous personal devotion to the Holy Prophet, which is narrated by the, the Hanbali biographers and historians. Um, all of this is enshrined in the greatest of the many books that he wrote, which is one of the great books of Islam, which is his Musnad a truly enormous work, 13 volumes in the new Thesaurus Islamicus uh, version of the Musnad, um, which is the first time it's been printed properly. Uh, alhamdulillah, it's good that Western scholars as well as uh, Azharis have worked to create the first ever really accurate version of the Musnad of Imam Ahmad, the new uh, issue, and um, we've had the privilege of engaging with it with the Sunnah project here in Cambridge. The new edition of the Musnad contains 250 more hadiths than those which exist in the older Middle Eastern edition, simply because the scholars went back to the first manuscript and found hadiths which simply had never been uh, incorporated before, but a magnificent work. Uh, a Musnad, for those of you who don't know what a Musnad is, is a hadith collection, but one which is not arranged like uh, most of the other works by subject, but is uh, arranged uh, according to the name of the companion who transmitted the hadith. So there's the Musnad Aisha, the Musnad Abu Huraira, the Musnad Ibn Abbas, and so forth, which is, a, a, for those of us who are not hadith experts, makes it rather a difficult text to use. You don't have an index, or you don't have it on the CD-ROM. It's not obvious where you find a hadith on wudu in the Musnad of Ahmad, but for the scholars it's a very useful way of, of sorting out the hadith. And it's an enormous work, and really, you could say that it is his greatest gift to the Ummah, this extraordinary monument, which, although it looks like a kind of directory of hadiths, uh, in fact is simply uh, a testimony to the love that the Imam had, which drove his entire long life, alhamdulillah, um, of the Chosen One, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that enabled him to rise to such terrifying challenges uh, and to remain as a kind of perfumed memory uh, in the hearts of everybody in the Ummah of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us this thing which was his gift to Imam Ahmad, which is love of the Chosen One sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to give us the blessing of a strong memory so that we may have the words of the Chosen One in our hearts, to give us something of the Imam's lack of interest in the finery of this world so that we find our pleasure in scholarship, in worship, in relationships, in family and not in stuff and in matter. And inshallah through this love to revive the inward as well as the outward dimensions of Islam in this age. So we ask Allah to have mercy on the soul of Imam Ahmad and also on the soul of Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, Imam Abu Hanifa 
and all of those who have given their lives to serve their madhabs in order to serve the way of the Chosen One, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Barakallahu fikum wa al-afu minkum wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Oh, oh, oh.